Good morning. My name is Lee Camp. I'm a faculty member in the College of Bible and Ministry, and I'm very grateful this morning to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, my students who have had me any time over the last five years probably get tired of hearing me share with them my favorite quote from the early church fathers, Irenaeus in the second century, who said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And one of the reasons I'm grateful to get to call Shane Claiborne a friend is he's one of those people that's fully alive. And uh, I, I love watching him simply do the things he does and write the things he writes and say the things he says and travel to the places to which he travels. Shane's a Tennessean, grew up in East Tennessee, and he's become well known in uh, the last number of decades as a Christian activist and an author. Uh, if, you, if you go look up new monasticism online, you'll find that he's one of the leading figures in this sort of movement that takes seriously what, uh, what your generation and the genera the, those in decade ahead of you are teaching us. And that is the importance in a world that lives according to such individualistic standards, the deep need that we have for true community and true friendship and living together in intentional and beautiful ways. So I love, for example, that uh, what Shane was doing yesterday was weeding the gardens in the block that they have tucked away in various places and alleyways in the, in the block where he lives in Philadelphia or the way in which they, he and his wife have children in their homes or how they live in intentional community there in Philadelphia. Uh, as a younger man, even, he, uh, he did lots of interesting things like uh, traveling to be with Mother Teresa during a 10-week term in Calcutta or spending three weeks in Baghdad with the Iraq uh, peace teams, Christian peacemaker teams, uh, bearing witness to the bombing of Baghdad and paying attention to the way in which war is truly a horrific impact upon the lives of ordinary people. He's always sought to bear witness to the ways of Christ in all that he does. Lots of books, lots of writings, Jesus for President, Politics for Ordinary Radicals, The Irresistible Revolution, Living as an Ordinary Radical, or this one from Esquire magazine. I love this title, especially that it was in Esquire magazine. What if Jesus meant all that stuff? Which I think is a good place for us to summarize what Shane has sought to do and bring before us. So, welcome Shane, and let me pray over him. Thanks, Gracious God, we give thanks for the gifts of this day and for your mercies, which are new to us every morning. We're grateful that you have called us into your kingdom, and we pray that you would help us, O oh God, bear witness to your peacemaking and to your justice and your kindness and compassion in the world. We're thankful that this brother has come to be with us today. We pray your blessings upon him, not just in the next 20 minutes or so, but in the continued years of much work of sowing and watering the seeds of your kingdom. And bless all those with whom he labors and loves in Philadelphia. May your kingdom come in all of its fullness. Your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be back at Lipscomb. I've been here a few times and love it every time. And uh, these chapels are a little tricky because you get 20 minutes, but we're going to do a lunch forum for anybody that wants to talk longer. I hope you'll come. Uh, I, I first, though, I grew up in Tennessee, so I wanted to tell you a story I heard growing up uh, about a homeless guy that came to worship on Sunday morning. And he came to sort of the fancy church, you know, and, and he was wearing all of his street clothes, had his bags with him, and he sat down up front. Uh, and sadly, everybody sort of looked at him like he didn't quite belong. And um, the pastor came up and said, Sir, I don't know if you've been here before, but this is the house of God. And I want you to do something. I want you to ask God what you should wear when you come to church. And so the homeless guy left that week and uh, the week passed and the next Sunday he came back same as he had before wearing all his street clothes had his bags with him and sat up front and the pastor kind of preemptively came up before the service and said sir I recognize you you were here last week and I asked you to do something did you do it and the man said yeah pastor I asked God what I should wear and uh, 
Jesus said he didn't know because he's never been to your church. I kind of like that one, a little sassy, you know. Uh, but I, I think we know a lot of times we're good at making people feel excluded. Uh, sometimes the very people that were magnetized to Jesus haven't always felt the love in the church. And so this morning, uh, I get to share a little bit about God's heart for tearing down walls and building subversive friendships and uh, uh, bringing in the very people who the world has kind of excluded. And that's kind of where our story started in Philly. Uh, I mean, we, we started hanging out with folks on the street. And I'll be honest, in, from East Tennessee to North Philly is quite a leap. And uh, I hadn't really met many homeless folks growing up and I can remember one of the, I'll tell you one of the first times I went downtown to spend time with folks living on the street I was so nervous that I was going to get mugged um, that I hid all of my credit cards and my cash in my dorm room and we went down to hang out with folks on the street and while we were downtown somebody broke into my dorm room and stole all my credit cards and went to TJ Maxx I know because we caught them on tape but you know that like and I thought all these folks that I uh, was nervous around I had no reason to be and these folks that I had somehow become convinced were be uh, above reproach you know and would never do anything like that it was so much different and the, the last 20 years of my life have kind of proved that lesson over and over, but I uh, became very troubled by how our city in Philadelphia, the city of love, like we had begun to make it very difficult for people living on the streets. Philadelphia, like many cities, Nashville is one of them, uh, began to systemically pass laws that made it difficult for folks on the, on the street, laws that made it illegal to sleep in public places, illegal to eat uh, uh, in public parks. One of the laws in Philly was a feeding ordinance that made it illegal to share food in any public parks in downtown Philly. And uh, I don't know, something about that just didn't quite feel right, you know. And so we started praying together, and then we started having some public picnics together in the parks. And we had shirts on that said, if Jesus had done the fish and loaves thing in Philly, he would have gone to jail. I'm glad like three of you got that joke. You need to read your Bible more, Lipscomb. But anyway, like we had our shirts, you know, we went, we started public picnics and we eventually got arrested and things like that. My mom was not happy, but we uh, fought through the court. And what was amazing was we had these public hearings, right? Where we were able to explain why we were feeding people when our city would made it illegal. And it was amazing because you had all these different folks, uh, uh, deeply committed Christians, some who were uh, Pentecostals, some who were Catholic, you know, all different stripes of Christianity. This one woman stood up and she said, 15 years ago, God told me to start making casseroles and taking them, uh, to take them down to the homeless on the boulevard and feed them every week. So I've been doing that every week for 15 years. And if the mayor wants to stop it, then the mayor better talk to God because God started it all. And then after that woman, there was this wonderful Catholic theologian that stood up and actually articulated so powerfully that when we feed the homeless, we don't believe that we're just feeding some pitiful person on the street. We believe that it is a sacrament. And when we feed the homeless, we are feeding Jesus. It was amazing. And uh, it actually ended up he argued that to say that we cannot feed the homeless is to say that we cannot feed Christ. Uh, and when we come before God and God says, when I was hungry, did you give me something to eat? We're not going to say, sorry, God, our mayor wouldn't allow it. Uh, you know, and so it went all the way to a federal court that actually ruled that it is a violation of our religious freedom to say that you cannot feed someone who's hungry on the streets. Come on, right? It's beautiful. So I, I think I, it's been amazing to watch the church kind of rise up and be the church to say to uh, uh, this world that those who have been excluded are at the very center of the banquet of God. The last are first, the first are last. We, we had one congregation who began to welcome homeless folks. A lot like you all have done. I'm, I got to hang out with Macy and some of the other students, how you did the room in the end here at Lipscomb. And 
There's a network of congregations in Philly that started welcoming the homeless. Beautiful testament of God's hospitality and generous love. But uh, uh, some city officials came in and they, they started to say, well, you know, you're not really outfitted to be a shelter. You don't have all the proper permits and documentation. And, uh, and they said, we're going to shut this thing down. And these guys are Pentecostals. You don't mess with the Pentecostals, you know. And, and they said, we're going to pray about this. They came back and they met with the city officials like a week later. And um, they said, listen, we've heard what you said, that we can't run a shelter. So we're not going to run a shelter. We're going to be the church, though. So we'll call it a revival. And we're going to have a revival every night. About 8 o'clock, our doors are going to fling open and we're going to invite everybody in. And Lord willing, that revival is going to go all night long. And uh, they started having this revival. It was amazing. You know, we, uh, the, the news was trying to cover this and doing diff having difficulty with the nuances in the story. You know, the, the, I remember on the news, they said, uh, yes, uh, we've just talked to the pastor. He said they're no longer running a shelter. They're having a revival. Back to you, Bob. You know, and uh, they're trying to cover the, this story. And it was so beautiful to see the church be the church. We went one night, my buddy and I, to the revival, right? It was awesome. It was like after, you know, this powerful time of worship and we had a meal together and families shared their stories and uh, many of them would be on the streets if it weren't for the warm love of this church and uh, uh, they shared their stories. We had communion together and then after like three hours, one of the pastors goes, all right, that concludes our, corm our formal revival service. The next Eight hours will be silent meditation and contemplative prayer. Everybody have a good night. You know, and uh, as far as I know, like that revival is still going. And, and it's that which I think Jesus said we're to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves in this world. That we are to show God's love and God's grace in ways that confound the patterns of the world. Right? That we don't conform to the patterns of exclusion, of, of casting away those who are most marginalized. But we've got to have a new imagination with how we live as the people of God in the world. As Dr. King said, we're not to be the chaplain of the state, but the conscience of the state. That we, we're actually to teach this world God's radical love. And in this world, I think one of the things that is endangered right now is love and grace and hospitality. And we think of the fruits of the Spirit, goodness, gentleness, kindness, these beautiful things that, that God is like. And, and yet uh, we can see what happens when fear begins to trump love. That we begin to see what, what happens when fear uh, kind of begins to rule our political imagination. We, there doesn't, there's not much room for love, right? But we know that Scripture says that love, perfect love, casteth out fear. So we can live fearless lives. And that's why I, I'm so encouraged by Christians kind of expressing God's love in fearless ways all over the, the world right now. I got to go hang out uh, along the border between the U.S. and Mexico. And there's a group, group of Christians there that are uh, deeply troubled about the immigration crisis. And they uh, have begun to see that, uh, you know, they're not going to wait on politicians in D.C. to tell us how to treat immigrants. They said, we started reading our Bible and we saw that it says very clearly that when we see the foreigner or stranger, we're to welcome them as if they were our own flesh and blood because we were once foreigners in the land and God welcomed us. And so they started this sanctuary movement of Christians committed to hospitality along the border. And they have lawyers that can help people that, uh, with their documentation if they need help with that. But what was amazing was they said, we wanted to bear witness of God's love. As Jesus said, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. When you don't welcome the stranger, you don't welcome me. And so they organized these worship services along the wall, which is pretty awesome because they had folks that were living in Mexico that walked to the wall and they were met by Christians on the U.S. side that met them on the other side. And then they sang each other hymns over the wall. 
And they said, we began to worship Jesus together over the wall. And they said, in one week, we got really excited. And we decided to serve each other communion by throwing the bread up over that wall. And, and you look at that and you say, that's the defiant love of Jesus that says our love doesn't stop at borders. Our love is not bound by biology or nationality. Our love is boundless because we are born again in the name of Jesus to say that, that if someone is suffering, on the other side of a wall it's as heartbreaking as if it were our own child our own mother or father and so as we look at the these issues around the world of immigration and of refugees in crisis every single one of these is an opportunity to bear witness of God's radical love to say we're going to welcome the stranger and we know when we do it, we are welcoming Jesus. It's a, an amazing time to be alive and uh, almost everywhere we go, we see hostilities that are out there and I, I've had a chance to, to travel all over the Middle East. Uh, from, I mean, from Iraq to Jordan to both sides of Israel and Palestine. And, and you know, there's that wall there between Israel and Palestine that's uh, said to be the most sophisticated wall ever built in history. But as you go along it, there's these images that I, I think some of them will pop up on the screen here. You can see images that kind of invite you to see the people on the other side. And I had a, some friends that took me along the wall, and you see these images that, say, that refuse to let the wall have the last word, that say we're going to uh, see those who are on the other side. And uh, my friend, Sammy Awad, who's a hero of mine, he's a, uh, he's a Christian, and he's Palestinian. He lives uh, in the West Bank side, actually right in the town of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And uh, as you look at some of these images, one of the things that he's taught me is that we have to have new eyes, that we can see people who have been divided by walls and hostility, that we can see the humanity in other people. And Sammy is a, I like that one. Um, as Sammy uh, uh, said, as a Palestinian Christian growing up, he, he grew up seeing the wall and he, he saw hatred. He saw hatred for his folks. And he, he said, but then I began to feel God move something deeper in me. And he, he said that the Spirit led him to uh, Germany on a pilgrimage to understand the Jewish story, the Jewish pain, the Holocaust. He went to Auschwitz. He went to the Holocaust Museum. He began to see the, the, the story of the horror of what was done to Jewish people. And he said, now I look at the wall differently, Sammy says. He says, I no longer just see hatred. I see fear. And it's a fear that doesn't justify the injustice of what's happening now, but it does explain it. And I want to know the pain on the other side of the wall. And so as I think of our Jesus and the incredible ways that He tears down walls, it's like there's constantly new uh, stories of reconciliation that just stun me. You know, I, I've been um, studying the death penalty recently because I, I, I'm, I'm, as I look at like grace and what it kind of invites us to, there's, no, there's nothing that like looks more disgraceful than, than some of the forms of justice we've become used to. And I, I got to know this one story I want to tell you this today. And uh, it was uh, a guy named Billy Neil Moore who came back from the war in Vietnam, actually. And uh, he was very troubled. And he and some army buddies decided uh, they were strapped for money. And he had never had any criminal history or life of crime. But he ended up... Um, uh, they, they had a house that they decided to rob, and they thought it would be a really easy way to get money. But it turned out that things, it was a terrible decision, of course. Everything went haywire, and uh, the homeowner was killed. And Billy Neil Moore, after that happened, was so haunted by what he did, uh, he had no reason to live. He turned himself in. He faced the death penalty. In fact, he said, if I could have pushed the button on my own execution, I would have done it. I had no reason to live. And uh, he tried to kill himself in prison. But then there was an interruption. Check this out. The victim's family 
were Christians, right? And they reached out to Billy Neil Moore and they said, listen, we hate what you did to us. You took someone we love from us and we will grieve that for the, for the rest of our life. No, nothing will bring him back. And they said, but we believe in Jesus. We believe in second chances. We believe in grace. We believe that mercy triumphs over judgment. And they said, we, we're going to try to stop your execution. And we want you to know that Jesus loves you. In fact, Billy Neil Moore became a Christian through all of this, right? And, and, and uh, the victim's family became the biggest advocates for his life. And they said, he's a different man now. He's a new creation. And uh, they argued against his execution just hours before he was to be executed. His execution was stopped. And he ended up uh, being, in a very rare move, released from prison. And today, Billy Neil Moore is a pastor. And he's my friend. And I think that is the scandal of God's grace, right? It flies in the face of everything that we see in this world that would reinforce walls and exclusion and disgrace. And yet Jesus offers us this beautiful vision of a new creation, of a world without walls, a world where God's love can flow freely through our streets. And so it's my dream that as a church, we would discover that love in a fresh way, right? That it would cause us to think differently about all of these other conversations that are out there, that everything we're forming our life around is Jesus and the love of God, and that nothing can stop that, neither height nor depth nor anything in the entire world, neither angels or demons or hell or anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God, amen? Amen. So let me pray for us. Well, that 20 went, minutes went fast, God. But thanks for the dreams that you're continuing to stir in us. And I pray that you would make us agents of reconciliation in this world. That as you said, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, that we would be people who are living differently because of what you're doing in us and in this world. Make us people who don't conform to the patterns of this world, the patterns of racial segregation, the patterns of inequity and exclusion, but make us people who confound the patterns of this world through your love. Make us people who have faith to believe in second chances to believe that life is more powerful than death, that love can wear hatred down. Make us people who live with a defiant hope in your resurrection, O oh Jesus. For this world we know is starved for grace. So let us listen to the whisper of how much you love us and may the whisper of your love transform us so that we become light in this dark world. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.